Uh, I'm not going to give a very long introduction, unlike my other long introductions that I sometimes give at these events. But um, I'm very happy to have Zainab and Ed doing the heavy lifting here. Uh, well, we, and Michael and I will, Michael's first responder and will be responding as usual and I will be uh, also, part, obviously, uh, the interlocutor is trying to connect and develop uh, the discourse. Um, Zainab uh, Alexander is a associate professor of architectural history at the Department of Art, History, and Archaeology at Columbia University. And her work is focused on the history and theory of architecture. Sorry. Great. History and theory of architecture since the Enlightenment. Uh, uh, she attended uh, Istanbul Technical University and uh, did an MR, is it true that you did an MR at Harvard Graduate School, a GSD here, received her PhD from the History, Theory, and Criticism program at MIT. She's the author of Kinesthetic Knowing, Aesthetics, Epistemology, Modern Design, which just came out and is excellent. I highly recommend it. Uh, it's a history of an alternative mode of knowing, non-propositional, non-linguistic, and based on the movements of the body that gained saliency in the 19th century and informed epistemological logic of modernism in the German-speaking world. Uh, soon to come out is another book called Design Techniques, with the Archaeologies of Architectural Practice that was co-edited, a series of essays co-edited with John May, who teaches here and runs one of the MDES programs. Uh, and that's coming out from University of Minnesota Press. So a lot's coming from Zainab in many forms. She's widely published in numerous uh, journals and uh, publications, including the Journal of Society of Architectural Historians, New German Critique, uh, Critique and so forth. She's also, fortunately for us, uh, currently at work on a new book, which we're going to hear about today, which uh, specifically uh, is what um, uh, Zainab calls uh, homogeneous, homo homogeneity or homogeneous empiricism. And it regards uh, Linnaeus, who was taxon taxonomist, who uh, came up with names for all of the uh, natural living forms all over the world, and Kew Gardens, which was the herbarium where s many of his uh, uh, many of his samples, his you know dried plant samples and other things were were kept. Um, and her book um, uh, is uh, it so in some sense is much more expansive kind of subject matter explores 19th century architecture of bureaucracy from the Q herbarium to the Larkin administrative building. So Zainab is also a member of the uh, aggregate. Architectural History Collaborative and an editor of MIT uh, journal Gray Room. So it, this will be very interesting, and I will. Uh, I think what I'll do is wait and introduce Ed just before he talks. There's more seats. You can go sit down. Oh, wait a minute. Let me see. Do I want to say something else? I think I'm going to introduce Ed now and get it over with. <laughs> Well, just to get me over with, and, and then I can move into my other, you know, uh, my other modality as the person who is, uh, the, you know, working in and out of the subject matter. Uh, so uh, Ed, who, whom you may know already, he's a senior lecturer here uh, in the history of architecture and landscape architecture. A, he's an historian of what he calls the long 19th century. I think every century is incredibly long, though. <laughs> Once you get into it, it never ends, those centuries. They just go on and on. Yeah. Uh, but in European and Anglo-American contexts, his research and teaching focus on relationships in and between humanist and uh, humanistic and scholarly traditions and the natural sciences and allied practices of knowledge production. Um, he, too, did his doctorate in history and theory of architecture at MIT. His writing, uh, grounded in uh, uh, his many of his writings, which are grounded in the uncertain terrain of landscape, which is incredibly provocative, have ranged from questions of botanical, zoological systematics, the creation and loss of great and not so great museums and libraries. These are his words. The history of the weather 
and acts of plagiarism in the founding documents of architectural theory. You can imagine the entertain, entertainment aspect of these writings is very great. All of these studies engage in questions of historical narrative and the species of evidence upon which it depends and or invents along the way. Uh, there are chairs right out there if you want to grab a chair up there. If you want to get, there's a bunch of chairs there if you want to grab one. There's still some more here too, yeah. You can sit down if you want to over there. Um, so uh, Ed's, mo Ed's most recent book on accent episodes in architecture and landscape, MIT Press, seeks to reclaim and provide uh, forms of in, uh, interpretability for unfamiliar incidents and artifacts that fall outside the canon. I can, I can testify that that book is also an incredible book, another amazing work that questions historiography and a whole variety of other uh, sort of unseen and seen uh, forces that we are, you know, we are constantly engaged with in, in our work. Also, uh, he has a current monograph project, and I mentioned this for its title, which is called Beyond the Rose Garden, and for the fact that it includes the grassy knoll, which I love the grassy knoll. It's like so, so poignant, the grassy knoll. In the, uh, but the, the book is about the, 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 the landscapes and architectures associated with American presidents. And the grassy knoll was, of course, where uh, President Kennedy was, from which uh, uh, President Kennedy was assassinated. So there's a, uh, you know, anyway, so great. These, uh, <laughs> that's a, a, too bad for him, and I'm very sorry, and I'm sorry the grassy knoll has to be that. The, uh, but uh, no, uh, very interesting work. So these people are friends and colleagues of each other. They've grown up in, you know, they've grown up uh, in, in their professions and so forth together, and um, uh, uh, Ed is also a member of the Aggregate Collective, and uh, they and so they know each other, and they're also friends and colleagues of Michael and myself, and uh, a lot of uh, people who teach here and elsewhere. And so it's a collegial event we're trying to put together here. I'm not seeking a critical stance. Um, here that is uh, reminiscent of earlier theoretical methods or anything. I'm not standing for that, as I sometimes do stand for that, but not now. Uh, basically, it seems to me this work is so intriguing on its own. It's principled, it's exciting, it's focused, um, and uh, we're lucky to have these uh, sharp intellects in our midst. So I'm gonna turn it over to them, and then we'll have a conversation afterwards. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Catherine, for the lovely introduction, for the invitation, for Michael being um, willing to be the first responder. I'm curious to see how a uh, first responder <laughs> responds. Uh, and especially to Ed for you know, taking this on. I'm really excited about the prospect of comparing notes on history writing now that we are talking on the same topic or similar topic for once. So since Catherine, um, ingeniously titled this conversation, is it not working? Um, restless metabolic systems, I had to look up what the metabolism is. So it turns out that in the 19th century, when the term seems to have emerged, the distinguishing mark of a metabolism was being what we would today call a closed system. What made Helmholtz's 1847 paper on the conservation of force so scandalous, for example, was the suggestion that energy could be converted from one form to another, but never be entirely lost. And this goes under Kraftwechsel or Stoffwechsel in German. In the midst of debates about materialism, Helmholtz's theory plugged all possible holes in the universe by taking away the possibility of teleology. If we follow this particular 19th century definition of metabolism, the material that I will present today suggests that some important holes could not be plugged after all. This material, as I hope I can show you, ignored the metabolic, metabolic condition that the 19th century had discovered and instead promised the possibility of infinity, something that I'll talk uh, about a great deal. But let me begin with a more 
modest thing, with the drawing of a simple cabinet that appeared in 18th century editions of Philosophia Botanica by the Swedish naturalist Carl Linnaeus. The drawing shows a tall cabinet in elevation with its two doors swung open so that we see 24 shelves um, inside, arranged into two columns. This, Linnaeus explains, is a herbarium. Not only a dry garden, Hortosicus, that holds dried plant species, but also a method for collecting data about them. It's a method because Unlike its predecessors, this herbarium stores plant specimens between loose sheets of paper, which means that the botanist can change the position of the specimen in the cabinet as the collection grows and as species are added or subtracted. The right image looks, uh, the right image shows you what the interior of the original Linnaean cabinet looks like today. In short, Linnaeus implies, readjusting the shelves is all it takes to revise botanical theory. Oops. Historians tell us that Linnaeus, known as the inventor of modern taxonomy, did not so much invent modern taxonomy as systematize it. That is, he synthesized techniques that had been developed during the past two centuries by other naturalists, all the while trying to tidy up the sprawl of new species arriving from colonies. This was first and foremost a matter of cleaning up nominal redundancy. Linnaeus eliminated what he considered to be arbitrary nomenclature and gave each plant two names. The name of its genus followed by the name of its species according to the plant's sexual properties. This was done with a theological agenda that conveniently overlapped with that of the emergent logic of political economy. After the fall from Eden, ordering the world to restore it to its original state of abundance was as much the obliga obligation of a devout Christian as a project to be implemented to explore the economic interests of a nation. As far as Linnaeus was concerned, Botany had two principal responsibilities, both of which were economic. First, the surveying of new species, and second, the acclimatization of foreign plants to the homeland, a project that he miserably failed at, by the way, in the forbidding climate of Sweden. Naturalists before Linnaeus had undertaken ambitious projects to assemble herbaria, usually in bound volumes of the kind that you see here, but Linnaeus did so using what media theorists have been calling paper technologies. That is, he collected and systematized his specimens with the aid of lists, diagrams, tables, slips of paper, and last but not the least, the herbarium cabinets. One might even say that Linnaeus's taxonomic ingenuity was to imagine new ways to spatialize his data. The herbarium cabinet offered something new. Because each specimen was now on a single sheet of paper, it was a discrete entity, unique in itself, but comparable in size, form, and composition to all the others. This meant not only that its position within the herbarium cabinet could be changed, but also that the collection could be expanded ad infinitum, at least in theory. In the century that followed, in fact, this is exactly what happened. Linnaeus' systematics for botany grew from the modest cabinet that he described in Philosophia Botanica to occupy whole buildings and entire complexes with global reach. This collection effort, I want to argue here today, was not simply the amassing of a large but ultimately finite number of specimens. The possibility, if not the practicability, of infinity performed a magic of sorts. As I hope to show, it operationalized what the 17th century philosopher William Petty would call political alchemy. Now, historians have recently been arguing that alchemical thinking was crucial to the emergence of political economy 
especially in England. Over against the neo-Aristotelian emphasis on restoring hierarchy, order, and balance, those who promoted this new economic order were convinced that infinite progress or improvement, if you want to use the technical term, was possible through the continuous pursuit of knowledge, innovation, and industry. Just as alchemy could theoretically solve the problem of scarcity of money by transforming base metals into gold. It's the empiricism of this political alchemy that I'd like to examine through the example of the herbarium at the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew, which I've been uh, showing you here. Now, for the sake of convenience, I will call this sensibility homogeneous empiricism. It's my own term. I've got into trouble in the past for inventing my uh, phrase, so I'm being upfront here. <laughs> In doing so, I'm borrowing from Lorraine Daston and Catherine Park, who in their remarkable book on wonders have traced the emergence of the fact that favored epistemic unit of modernity out of strange or preternatural facts in the early modern period. They've argued that in the work of Francis Bacon, for example, these unusual particulars, for example, conjoined twins, produced a new and grainy empiricism in which particulars departed from the general, thus undermining the authority of deductive reasoning. In their telling, early modern Wunderkammern, in this case you're looking at one that was gifted to uh, Linnaeus' uh, hometown, so these cabinets of curiosities in which a pitcher made out of an otillus shell might sit next to a mathematical instrument or a mummified monkey's claw, these were displays of a grainy or, if you will, heterogeneous empiricism, which paved the way for what some historians would like to call the scientific revolution. Linnaeus's herbarium and the complexes that followed its architectural logic, by contrast, displayed what I would like to call homogeneous empiricism. This brand of empiricism also privileged the particular, but these particulars, unlike those in the Kunstrunk on your left, were elementary and discreet. One herbarium sheet corresponded to exactly one variation of a species. And standardized, information appeared on each in more or less the same fashion. They were also portable. Thanks to the flatness of paper, not only were the specimens easy to arrange and rearrange within the herbarium, but unlike live plants, they could also be transported to and from distant sites. This arrangement allowed for other kinds of flexibilities. In the case of Q, while the specimens were arranged and rearranged several times in the course of the herbarium's history, most notably after the uh, rise of evolutionary theory in the 19th century, but then again in the 20th century when uh, the collection had to be revised based on genetic affinity rather than on morphological resemblance, even after all these changes, the individual specimen files state essentially the same. And finally, because the architecture that accommodated these standardized particulars were generic and modular, the assumption was that it could be repeated and expanded infinitely to encompass all possible knowledge. As we will see, these qualities gave homogeneous empiricism much power in the 19th century. Whoever built the cabinet, it turns out, could also rule an empire. Before I turn to Q, however, I should say a word about why I'm interested in this history. This material, as Catherine already explained, comes from the first chapter of my new book on 19th century storehouses of information. Examining the spatial logic of these sites, I argue that the arrangement that we would today call a database was first and foremost a political technology. That is, the proto-databases of the 19th century were a unique solution to a problem of governing inherent in modern capital. How do you do things from a distance? And I suggest that the homogeneous empiricism of the kind that one finds in Q anticipated today's epistemic regime of big data and the information overload that we associate with it. 
Architectural history, I would insist, is particularly suited to undertaking this kind of analysis. Data, after all, is useless without an architecture, whether that architecture is cabinets or drawers that file paperwork, buildings that house servers, tables that make data visible, or for that matter, satellites and orbit that push it out of sight. So in the spirit of mechanization takes command, the book is ultimately about humble things, cabinets, drawers, shelves, and that's even my tentative title, but things that have nonetheless shaken our modes of living to its very mo uh, roots. So I don't have time to give you even a brief history of Q, but let me just remind you that these gardens were not simply the display of the picturesque, that nexus of aesthetic, political, and economic theories in the 18th century. Next to landscapes designed for aesthetic pleasure was land carefully cultivated to make a point about royal uh, virtue. And to that and please notice the sheep and the tools prominently displayed in the foreground of the palace in this image. So these gardens were set up to display in miniaturized form how far national wealth could go if agricultural knowledge could be advanced under the protection of an enlightened monarch. For the history that concerns us here, however, we need to jump to the middle of the 19th century when the gardens were transferred to the custody of the Office of Woods and Forests and the naturalist William Jackson Hooker was appointed as its director. Under Hooker and later his son's watch, new nurseries were built to accommodate plants that, could, that would otherwise not survive in the cold British climate, the grounds were redesigned, and at the very uh, moment that the complex was uh, co uh, converted from royal gardens into a public park, a research center was established on the northernmost tip of the complex, right here, uh, which, uh, according to contemporaries, made Kew the botanical metropolis of the world. What Greenwich is to astronomy, the National Gallery to painting, the British Museum to archaeology, one commentator would note in 1908, such is Q to botany. This was in no small part because of the herbarium that was set up in 1852 in one room of a small building known as the Hunter House, based on the model promoted by the Linnaean Society in London. The herbarium's ambitions of endless expansion, however, quickly ran into a wall, as these things tend to do. An addition around, uh, arranged around a three-story tall central atrium was built in 1879. A second one with almost an identical plan was constructed in 1901. A third addition followed in 1930. A fourth one in the 1960s, which is what you see up here. And a fifth one, um, uh, just uh, about two decades ago in the basement, and another one, by the way, is in the works, to say nothing of a seed bank, uh, bank called the Millennium Seed Bank that was established off-site. So I thought uh, it might be productive at this point to compare this strategy of expansion that you see in uh, Q to that discussed by Ed in his essay on Herbarium. Ed's protagonists too wanted to expand toward an infinite horizon, but they did so, for those of you who are uh, familiar with this particular essay, they did so through a circular plan. But as much as they sought to enlarge the circle to which they have been confined, Ed writes, and Ed, please correct me if I'm wrong in, in, you know, the, in the way they understand the essay, the circle was indeed to be expanded, but not disrupted. In the case of Q, in order to see a similar kind of circle, subject to as much expansion as to disruption, we need to leave the herbarium and look beyond. Q, after all, was nothing without the subsidiaries upon which it relied for specimens, most notably in India and in the West Indies, but also in other parts of the Americas and Asia, as well as in Africa, Australia, and even in Antarctica. Live plants in pots and dry plants pressed between sheets of paper traveled back and forth between Q and these stations. Seeds, equipment, expertise, and personnel were traded. Information 
too much of it, Victorian naturalists constantly complained, flowed through this network. This flow, however, had to follow strict protocols that reinforced Key's, Q's uh, centrality. Once received that Q, specimens had to be quarantined, separated from their bulky parts, and attached to sheets. By women, by the way, uh, for most of Q's history, this is, uh, turned out to be a running thread through the book. These menial jobs by, are always done by uh, women. Before being given a name by expert botanists. An old one, if the specimen was a variation of a known species, or a new one, on the rare occasion, a new species was discovered and declared a type specimen. Because naming, the ultimate goal of this process, was best carried out through a process of triangulation. So the way that any species is named is by uh, the botanist pulling uh, related species, putting those species on the, these tables that you see between the cabinets and comparing them. There's very much an element of comparative looking at work here. So because of the uh, centrality of this process of triangulation, Q remained the privileged network, uh, center of this network. So pronounced was the center, centrality uh, of uh, Q that William um, Thistleton Dyer, the third director of Q, claimed that we at Q feel the weight of the empire as a whole more than they do in Downing Street. And in 1908, he explained this claim as follows. There are some 60, now I'm, this is um, Thistleton Dyer. There are some 60 distinct governments under the British crown, and in any technical difficulty, they all resort to Q. It did what was possible when coffee leaf disease brought financial disaster to Ceylon. The fortunate identification of a single leaf started the rubber industry of the Gold Coast. Q sent tea to South Africa. It gave cinchona to India. And a dose of quinine can be purchased at any Indian post office. More on this later. It transferred the South American rubber plants to the east. A chain of Q trained men dot the course of the future Cape to Cairo Railway. Scientific members of the Q staff hold important positions in India and in the Transvaal, and a former assistant director has done noble work in restoring agricultural prosperity in the West Indies. If you think this claim about bearing the weight of the empire is hyperbole, consider the case of sugarcane, Britain's long-standing cash crop. In 1884, when the price of sugar fell by 30% after France, Austria, and Germany started flooding the world market with sugar from beets, the British, British manufactories in the West Indies took a hit. But the colonial office in London, deeming it at variance with the general commercial policy of Great Britain to intervene in the situation, submitted the problem to Kew, which responded by setting up a botanical station there. Four years later, in 1888, when Daniel Morris, assistant director at Kew, who had just returned from Jamaica, advised a businessman still despondent over the ongoing global sugar slump to diversify their agricultural activities in the West Indies. Sugarcane itself had been transplanted in the region, he reminded them, thanks to the efforts of Q. Q had transferred the tea to Assam, Darjeeling, and Ceylon, and Sincona to India, a formidable weapon in colonial expansion, it turns out, since quinine could um, treat malaria. So Morris asked, why not transplant tobacco, lime, ginger, or India rubber in the West Indies now? Such crises show that Q's presence in Jamaica was not a luxury, but an absolute necessity. Despite Q's continuing reliance on Linnaean botany, this particular way of thinking was decidedly different. It required something that would come to be called botanical arithmetic. Uh-oh, here we go. 
The idea received its most famous theorization from the Prussian naturalist Alexander von Humboldt as a geography of plants, that is, exact quantitative rules for the appearance of variety in nature. During their trip to South America between 1799 and 1804, Humboldt and the French naturalist Bonpland match plant species to precise locations. The result was this famous section that I'm sure you've seen that correlated the distribution of plant species to latitude, temperature, sea level, cultivation of the soil, etc. that you see in those columns to the right and left of the image. Like Linnaeus's cabinet, such geographical imaginary spatialized botanical data, but now that spatialization was inscribed across an entire territory. Hooker's India journals, by the way, are also full of this kind of cross-referencing of the exact geomet uh, ge geographic location of a spot and the kind of plants that uh, grow in it. So botanical arithmetic share the same logic with isothermal maps that connected parts of the world uh, with the same uh, temperature at a given moment. Drawn not coincidentally, first by Humboldt, as you see here, but also by others. So this way of thinking manifested itself in two important ways at Q. On the one hand, the, um, a new kind of uh, nursery was set up in the middle of the uh, 19th century. The most important examples are the famous Palm House and the Temperate House. Nurseries that simulated the clim climate of the tropics much more accurately than their precedents, thanks to ingenious mechanical systems. On the other, Q naturalists work hard to establish something called botanical provinces. This is like a regionalization of the world. The Q herbarium today is still arranged according to 19 such provinces across the globe, but in the 19th century, Hooker went into much more detail. In India, for example, he correlated such specific conditions as temperature, humidity, uh, soil conditions, etc., to the distribution of plant uh, populations. So all those reg uh, regions with uh, red boundaries around them are coherent entities. It was this kind of cross-referencing afforded by the logic of botanical arithmetic that made Morris's logic of substitution possible in Jamaica. That is his suggestion that sugar might be replaced with indigo or tea. In the course of the 19th century, this cross-referencing function was crucial to the workings of a vast empire that was scattered across continents and that was repeatedly threatened by the next meltdown in the global market or the next rebellion in the colonies. To make the argument that tea from China could prosper in India, one had to check data about the former against that of the latter, longitude, altitude, soil conditions, humidity, and so on. This, in fact, was the real cunning of Q's homogeneous empiricism, holding together things that were decidedly heterogeneous. Not only the fruit, stems, leaves, and the seeds of live plants and dead plants, most of which did not fit between standardized sheets of paper anyways, and which sprawled into other cabinets at Q, but also an assortment of other entities, the expert botanist and the inexpert collector, the seed harvested in one part of the world and a new location where it might do well, a trained gardener and the pest solution that he might solve in a colony, a substance extracted from a plant, and a disease that it might cure elsewhere. Like the catalog of a library, and this is again comes back to Ed's uh, work on uh, the on libraries, the architecture of homogeneous empiricism paired and matched things in a complex and vast network that could easily break down precisely because of its heterogeneity, it served as the mediator of relationships. So what the Q herbarium thereby practiced was not only geographic but also 
economic botany, which Hooker defined as the study of the plants and plants products which directly or indirectly were of service to men. And you, you see this in this economic botany cabinet still in existence at Kew, displaying useful woods. As I've already mentioned, botany had been economic at least since Linnaeus, but in the 19th century, it took on a new role. Its purpose now was not only to maximize the wealth to be gained from vegetal sources, but also to facilitate a new kind of arrangement predicated on the premise of infinite improvement. Let me add parenthetically here, uh, that I'm using the word improvement in a very historical sense as the rhetoric utilized by the uh, British Parliament um, as it passed a series of acts from the 17th century onwards to enclose land uh, by turning uh, commons into uh, agriculturally productive land and by consolidating that land in the hands of aristocracy. Think back to Downton Abbey. <laughs> Historians have been arguing for a, now that, for a while now that British colonialism can be characterized as an enclosure movement of sorts inscribed uh, uh, across the globe. The operations of Q projected this logic, think back again uh, to Ed's circular plan here, into a glo global horizon. The logic of improvement and the logic of alchemy thus overlapped Improvement here was no longer a matter of maximizing the productivity of a finite plot of land in England, but rather an operation of transplantation, an operation that promised infinite possibilities abroad. But Kew's experiments at economic botany failed almost as often as alchemical experiments did. Sincona is a good example. In the 1860s, Q botanists carefully collected seeds of the Sincona plant used to treat malaria from Peru, germinated them in British greenhouses in Q, transported the young plants in especially designed cases to the botanic gardens in Calcutta, and introduced them to plantations in southern India, all by referencing data points on herbarium sheets that allow them to correlate the climactic conditions of the Andean mountains to those of the Nilgiri mountains in India. The result was a disaster. The transplanted Sincona failed to produ produce quinine that was powerful enough to cure malaria. Even then, Q's so-called Sincona scheme was by all appearances a success not only because it reinforced the importance of Q in the public eye and justified the public expenditure, but it also projected the image of an empire that compassionately cared for its subjects. Remember, quinine was available at every post office in India. Q's homogeneous empiricism held together precariously heterogeneous networks, and along with it, the British empires profoundly unstable body politic. Even when ships sank, plants died, herbarium sheets were eaten by pests, and Q solutions failed miserably then, the herbarium's political alchemy worked. When Q botanists shuffled paper in London, humans, plants, capital, and labor magically moved elsewhere. By standardizing, aggregating, and structuring information at a massive scale, the Q herbarium turned, if not base metals, paperwork into gold. Foreshadowing the information economies to come, Q's homogeneous empiricism monetized sheets of paper that otherwise had no intrinsic value. By this logic, the homogeneous empiricism found in the Q herbarium, or I would argue, in its distant relatives today, cannot simply be explained away as the logical and the inevitable outcome of what the historian Anne Blair has called the phenomenon of too much to know in the early modern period, or what we today might call information excess or data overload. 
that is as the predictable result of the overwhelming output of information, the technologies of printing, the steamship, the telegraph, or for that matter, the internet have made possible. Rather, I hope this kind of history gives us pause. If homogeneous empiricism has always been first and foremost a political technology that has been necessitated by modern modes of governing and sustaining a body politic, then all the more reason that we should accompany it by questions that address its political dimension. Thank you. I'll do my howdy do's while we wait. Um, I wanted to, of course, uh, thank my dear friend, Catherine, for setting up this um, opportunity to address these topics. Um, and it's enormously uh, rewarding for me to do so with um, Zainab, um, of whom I am, uh, and I remain in awe, because um, there are a few uh, interlocutors in our field for taking on these types of projects. And, um, and of course, to Michael, or as Zainab said, our first responder, we both imagine you coming with an EpiPen or a, <laughs> yeah, or, you know, some such thing as first, yeah, the first responder might do. Um, but just to preface this, because um, I'm of needs going very quickly, uh, I saw this, uh, this talk, um, this dialogue as an opportunity not so much to make a, um, a coherent presentation, it might be one, but rather to um, address a problem that's uh, long plagued me in a project which has been uh, ever so temporarily in abeyance. And I hope that um, this intervention will uh, present something of a um, opening up of new possibilities. If I, am, uh, if I provide an indecently truncated introduction to what is to follow, it is because of what else, the constraints of time. In presentations such as this, I typically aspire to the Horatian dyad to instruct and delight, perhaps with an anxious emphasis on the latter. Not today. This is not a delightful paper, though it was very instructive, at least to me, if perhaps no one else. I uh, took this uh, colloquium, particularly the metabolic prompt, as an opportunity to untangle a problem that has long plagued me. And here the problem is untangled. And I'll be going very quickly. Again, time. So about the title, Le Voir Venir. The philosopher and theorist of plasticity, Catherine Malabou, explains that in French, voir venir means to wait a while as is prudent, observing how events are developing. But it also suggests that other people's intentions and plans must be probed and guessed at. It is an expression that can thus refer at uh, once in the same time to the state of being unsure of what is coming and of not knowing uh, I'm uh, sorry, being sure of what is coming and not knowing what is coming. And this is the, the posture um, and attitude toward research I will be uh, looking at today. Um, to address what is, uh, as Antoine Picol taught me to regard as the properly um, historical question, I'll be talking about this laboratory on the bottom, which is Banyul Sommer on the Mediterranean coast of France near Port Bou, in relation ultimately to the laboratory at top, uh, which is in uh, Naples. It was founded by a German a naturalist named Antoine Do um, Anton Dorn. And um, this is from a, a publication from my protagonist, you see up here on the left, Henri de la Caz du Thiers, uh, in a very important presentation he gave in 1888 called The World of the Sea and Its Laboratories. And it's that conjunction I want to talk about. And I've highlighted that um, passage because of the voyeur, look, look what we have here. And, um, the question is the disparity and architectural uh, finesse, if you will, between this kind of uh, lumpy uh, French annex of the Sorbonne in Paris and this classically clad research outpost of Prussian uh, science. As for the voie venir, which is the central part, this dictum was used in various formulations and with changing attribution by my, my protagonist, Le Cas du Thiers, at numerous points throughout his career. And while not pretending to a full-out study uh, in genetic criticism, I want to derive a significance, conceptual and historical, from, this repeat, from its repeating and changing uh, usage. And what I'll do is um, try to map out how we get to Banyul-Sermad, to a, a fully articulated marine research laboratory 
And in the end, I want to come back to what was claimed by um, uh, Le Casse-Dutier's most faithful and I think comprehending student, Louis Boutin, you see on the left, as uh, Le Casse-Dutier's first experiment in experimental zoology, years before he had a laboratory to do so. And this had to do with these oak galls, which I'll talk about uh, in a moment. So uh, I begin with the flora legium here in deference to Zainab's a very beautiful piece on herbaria. Um, as you know, flora legium comes from the word flowers and also to gather or to read, to legere. It's a collection or a reading gathered up in some more or less um, arranged way. As Marie, Mary Crothers writes, a flora legium is basically the contents of someone's memory set forth as a kind of study guide for the formation of others' memories. And of course, the flowers I've gathered in this instance is the usage of this term va venir, and we'll see it gets a bit complicated. So as a pretext, here, uh, the origin of the term, uh, and this is what was alluded to on the poster for the event, uh, botanical iconography. This comes from the work of uh, uh, Turpin, his um, essay on uh, the potato plant. And you see it here, not referenced in the text, but as this motto at the uh, basis of the caption. Here is the text um, itself, which sets out what might be meant by this expectant posture of voivenir. He says, the general organization of living being and that of its organs in particular can only be explained when once one follows step by step, and that's a crucial term for this project, the successive development of its being from the first moment of its invisible formation to that of its death. And here, in his investigation of Solanum tuberosum, or again, the potato plant, he's seeking to differentiate uh, the roots and stems of the plant, about which there was a great deal of controversy, uh, the stems producing those uh, nodules or appendices, which become tubers or um, uh, uh, potatoes, um, as it were. And what you're seeing, the voie veneer, is uh, Turpin is showing on one sheet five stages in the uh, life and growth of this uh, single plant. It's a, it's a, a, a time-based um, image. Uh, one of Turpin's uh, interlocutors who became very uh, fascinated with his work was um, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, who in the later edition of his own uh, uh, biography of his botanical studies, uh, took the voie venir as the epigram uh, for his text. Um, and again, just to give you the background for this, and um, eventually uh, asked in some way for Turpin to uh, provide an illustration. You know this illustration. It's quite famous. Um, of, the, uh, of, uh, of Goethe's own ideas of the metamorphosis of plants. And Turpin comes up with this very uh, riotous um, image of um, the, uh, what refers back to kind of uh, Linnaeus's notion of prolepsis, the anticipation of plant parts in successive stages of growth, articulated there in the metamorphosis plants, taken up again in Goethe's text, and here transformed in uh, graphic terms. Right want to take this essence and bring it back into what I'll be discussing is the work that occupies uh, my guys, if you will, my protagonists here, for example, uh, Le Cas du Thier. Uh, here, very typically an organism that uh, served as the uh, excuse, the cause for founding his first research laboratory, which is in Roscoff in Brittany. You see the Pentacrinus uh, Europaeus. Uh, you see it's called a living encrine because until this moment, it was not thought to be um, a living specimen. It was thought to exist only in a fossil state. And we see it here in the three uh, stages of its uh, existence as a, a pinoculated uh, um, uh, larva. It's, uh, it's um uh, it, it's pentachronite stage, the stage is typically found as a, um, as a, a fossil, and then finally a free-living uh, comatulus, which could easily be mistaken as often was as an entirely different species. And the need to look at the life of a, a specimen is so you don't describe the same being at two states of its life as two separate um, uh, organisms. And in little uh, beasties and bugs that go through many instars of metamorphosis, you can imagine the problem that ensues. So here to begin my flora legium, formally speaking, is in uh, 1856 with um, Le Cas du Thiers' uh, essay on the uh, gills uh, in mollusks. And you see it here. I'm just going to highlight the use uh, here. Uh, uh, Voir um, venir les shows, he says, is the best way to understand them. There's already a shift in the usage from, uh, from um, expliquer to connaître. And here is a typical image from the cause du tier at this period. You'll see the uh, progressive perfection uh, embryologically of the gill 
uh, gills in the uh, mollusk. But I also want to highlight this text as the first usage of this term by Le Cas du Thier, because in it, he refers to the central importance of his teacher, Henri Milne Edwards' uh, new notion of uh, classification, here specifically of the mollusks, where he used embryological data to understand the relationships, the affinities uh, between the gray classes of uh, being uh, in animals. He based this originally on William Sharp McClay's um, The uh, Entomological Hours, where you see these uh, the main groups with these little insertions, these so-called osculating groups, which uh, stand betwixt and between the main phyla. But for, uh, look, um, for Henri de Milne Edwards, he uh, describes this. Um, uh, this is, a, again, a time-based uh, discussion discussion of um, affinities as expressed through embryological development. He says, zoological affinities are proportional and think of the spatial terms here, the measurable terms, the duration of certain parallelism in the course of genesic or um, genealogical phenomena among different animals. So that, uh, so that beings in the path of formation, remember that step by step we talked about, would cease to resemble each other that much earlier when they belong to high level groups in natural classification. The essential and dominating characters reside not in permanent particularities or organic form of the adult, but in the more or less prolonged existence of the common primitive construction, which uh, works its way out through um, uh, uh, ontogeny. For the relationships that exist, and here are the actual graphic means here he's drawing on, which are quite novel. For the relationships that exist between diverse zoological groups to be indicated in a figural manner, it must be possible to distribute them in space and the connections between them by lines, the direction of which would be susceptible to infinite variation. The ensemble of these groups would not result only in a surface, he says, but would take the form, and this is remarkable, a, a three-dimensional figure. However, with the aid of ordinary graphical means, one can uh, come very close to the desired goal, and one had arrives at it by distributing zoological groups on a plan more or less the, like the islands of a vast archipelago, where the distance between bits of Earth vary greatly. One would distinguish secondary archipelagos from uh, formed in turn by different groups. And here, if we have time later, we can talk about the whole problem of the issue of uh, continuity in nature, i.e. going from someone like um, Linnaeus to someone like uh, Gisieux, who in positing a natural system wanted there to be some degree of continuity. But to continue this, um, Little uh, my little flora legium. Here is Darwin uh, makes enormous good use of um, of uh, Milne Edwards' uh, 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 diagram precisely at the time he's working on his uh, barnacles, which he brought back from the uh, Beagle. But uh, just to say the complications of this voisinier principle. Um, here's a couple of years later where. Um, Le Cas du Thier is stating his kind of principled hesitation to accept the findings of uh, Darwin, where he says, to go back to the origin seems to me quite a problem. This at the same time and what my, Janet Brown across the walk here calls the first international scientific debate, when Darwin was put up for election at the Academy, Le Cas du Thier support, supported him qua naturalist, though not as theorist. And the relationship between theory and facts is a, a a preponderating uh, issue here. To continue our little roll call here, here in um, 1866, in the work for which he was originally uh, most famous, the work he did in Algeria uh, as part of the uh, colonial enterprise there, Le Cas du Thier looks at the growth of corals, which was an entirely and enormously baffling question for centuries. And here we see the voie venir, but here's this problem of attribution beginning to take place and splitting off. Uh, and these are the notes produced by his student, Louis Allais. We see the uh, Turpin va venir on one hand, attributed to both Goethe and Turpin now, but then uh, framed by another quote from Aristotle, which is important for us. If accordingly we begin at the beginning and consider things in the process of their growth, we shall be best be able, uh, this as in other fields, uh, to come to conclusions by the methods we employ. And this is headed all together by the dictum that uh, would guide uh, Le Cas du Thier in his career. It's a portmanteau phrase he made up um, from Destu de Tracy, where he says, our, our errors, and error was the issue, derives from our too great a haste to generalize our ardor to reduce everything down to principles. So the relationship of the general and the particular facts and theories, which will get stated again and again and again. 
Um, just to give you the source of the Aristotle, where he begins to enter, uh, on the page at least, this took place in his Natural History of Corals, where you see it as the um, epigraph uh, stated here. And the corals, if you look at the imagery, give you a sense of the type of observational practice that uh, Lucas Dutier is engaging in. On the right, the, uh, what he calls the lactation, which was a lactation of uh, spermatozoans uh, from the uh, coral, the development of the uh, larvae, and then the metamorphosis of the larvae in a many-step uh, process, which would take us uh, most of the day to explain, and I don't wish to undertake at this moment. Uh, but to go forward here again, you see the migration of the attribution from Turpin, simply stated, to Turpin, to Goethe. Now uh, it becomes a precept that's coming from Aristotle as such, a precept of Aristotle, the best ways of themes, things, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, again, restated, and you see the insistence of this refrain in uh, Lucas Dutier's work throughout his career. Here in another essay on uh, corals, where you can see um, these numbers indicating the cycle, uh, you kind of think the system for notating the cycle, but it's the cloison or the little chambers uh, uh, of the, um, of the uh, polyparies were uh, uh, produced. And then, again, moving forward, I'm just trying to give you a sense of how these land in his writings. Um, uh, here, definitively attributed to Aristotle without any hesitation. Uh, this from his text on the uh, Phonicurus, which I'll show you in just a moment. Uh, and he says, well, we'll see, again, the seeing how just and how well merited it is the practice of this maxim of Aristotle, of Lavenier, et cetera, et cetera. And the organism here is a very typical problem that would have confronted uh, Lucas Dutier and his students and his colleagues. So here's the Funicurus, which, uh, if you look at, uh, at Lucas Dutier's text, would look like a free living organism. In fact, he thought it was a parasitic organism that lived uh, upon this uh, mollusk, which is the uh, Tethys uh, leporina. And in his minute observations, he tries to induce a complete vascular, uh, hepatic, and nervous system for this um, organism, which was, in fact, uh, as was shown by uh, Corrado Corona, who had read Lucas Dutier's article and took to heart, in his words, this invocation to Boisvenier, and we studied the project and showed that, in fact, the Phonicurus uh, uh, was not uh, a parasitic organism that attached itself to the back of the mollusk, but rather was this kind of um, uh, uh, hepatic renal uh, appendages, which uh, would um, uh, uh, autonomize, which would uh, uh, autonomically um, uh, dissect themselves when the animal was preyed upon. And what he's showing on is the possibility of these uh, Phonicurus to regenerate uh, in time. So here, um, Lucas Dutier giving the inspiration through this dictum for another to check Lucas Dutier's own work and show what happened to be the case. And I'm only showing this uh, as well here because Phonicurus, as you probably detected, comes from uh, Phoenix or Phonus, uh, from the ancient dye that came from there, Tyre, the purple, and the saurus, or the tail, the purple tail. And I refer to what, what I think is one of Lucas Dutier's most beautiful work, which is on the, um, the natural history of a photographic exposure, where he produced an art counter origin story for uh, color photography by looking at the dye that's produced by the mucus of murex shells. And here is a photograph produced with that, so the purpura or the phoenix, the dye of ancient Tyre, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, seven minute alarm. Seven minutes left? Yes. Jesus. Okay. <laughs> Corona was helped along by in his investigation by another research that came out of um, uh, Roscoff here's of Frederic's discussion of uh, autonomia. And uh, finally, uh, the uh, the insistence again and again here, go to laboratory record, do this work, and uh, you'll live by this dictum. And uh, in the final usage of it that I've been able to find in his, um, his discussion of the flabellum, you see here on the bottom the evolution of the flabellum, this desire to see it through all its life phases. And this evolution in practical matters referred to this. It referred to sitting at the desk in an evolving chair, a rotating chair, and taking the organisms through the paces from uh, the thing in living nature, uh, to the center desk where they're, uh, after having been subjected to reagents and dyes, they're put under the microscope and then transformed into these uh, paper technologies that um, 
uh, Zainab was talking about, where they're fit then to uh, become volumes in the library for future reference. Here's the journal of the archive of the um, laboratory of the archive. Uh, and you see here now what was va venir becomes deja vu, which is say you can look to the archives and now uh, confirm and or um, consider these uh, findings. In the seven minutes left, I wanted to just very quickly Six minutes left. I want to consider what will soon be five minutes left. I want to consider very quickly um, this notion of economics or this metabolic system by reference to this gall. And uh, here, what I'm referring to is this kind of uh, discourse that um, Zainab laid out for us so very beautifully, coming from uh, uh, specifically from Linnaeus's uh, uh, treatises on uh, nature, but specifically here. Um, some uh, interesting developments within Lacaze Dutier's own uh, research. Lacaze Dutier took a medical degree, um, and then uh, his zoological studies with uh, Henri Milne Edwards uh, focused on the, the genital armor of um, insects. And here we see um, the reason I'm showing you this is the ovipositor of a, uh, of, a, of a wasp by which the wasp would inject its uh, eggs into a, uh, an oak leaf, by which would produce the gall. Um, and this is the first step in our understanding of what would be considered an economy here or a, um, uh, a metabolism. And here I'm referring to issues of transcendental uh, anatomy, as, or, as was articulated by Geoffroy Jeff, Saint-Hilaire. People think of Le Cas du Tier as a strict disciple of Cuvier. He was not. And um, here, just the way in which this works, the kind of compensation, and here he shows a, um, a theoretical schema for the integuments of the, um, the, uh, the animal, which could become larger and smaller in relation to one another, what was called by Joffre the law of balancement, or balance. Uh, and in his notes on natural selection, uh, Darwin attributed the idea of the balancement of organs, both to Joffre and Goethe. Darwin cites Goethe from an English translation of the Swiss naturalist Maurice Frédéric Guillaume Pictet's analysis of the French, uh, uh, the, the French edition of, uh, by Martin of Goethe's work, which I showed you earlier, which was the source of the voie venir, just trying to get to the internationalism of this uh, discourse. He says, here's Goethe, the budget of nature is fixed, but she is free to dispose of particular sums by any appropriation that may please her. In order to spend on one side, she is forced to economize on the other. And what happened here was um, what the oak gall provided Le Cas du Tier an opportunity to do is have a ready-made uh, experiment. Once the wasp infects the oak, the gall is produced, the larva grows. And what he could do is solve a, a very complicated riddle in science at the time, which had to do with the origin of fatty matter. Was fatty matter uh, ingested by organisms strictly from plant material, or was it synthesized within the organ itself? And what the gall provided for uh, the Cas-Duterre was a prison of sorts, an internal environment that was perfectly controlled in which to measure the, uh, the larva and its kind of chemical composition and in, in unison with his uh, friend, the chemist Riche, uh, and compare it to the composition of the uh, gall itself, a ready-made laboratory that was um, free from sin or free from error. And here you see the naturalistic representation, the chemical uh, assay that was provided by uh, Riche. Preparing the sorts very quickly, I have two minutes, I have one minute. Balance, how this is balancing out, how this gets to the, um, the, the historical question, properly speaking. And here I'm referring to the full meaning, the full ambit of the issue of um, economy or uh, nemesis or distribution. And here I'm referring to a text that Wolf Le Penny's calls an herbaria of moral matters. Here is Linnaeus's um, nemesis divina, divine nemesis, where he says talion or the lex talionis is exact retribution, the balancing of the scales, autopathia in Greek. This is a Polybian term, autopathia. The idea of a pain brought home, as he called it. It's an analog to uh, autopsia, or seeing for oneself. And what um, 
Linnaeus did in this is showed effectively for a one minute description is that the sins of the father are visited on the sons. It's karma, kismet, the universe speaking as you people would like to say, that no bad deed will go unpunished. And he went around uh, Europe collecting as if, Le Penny says, they were herbarium leaves. All these instances were divine nemesis, distribution, allocation, moral justice was done. And this entered back into the political discourse of France uh, mid-century through this text by Auguste Geoffroy, uh, where you see this unedited text by uh, Linnaeus called Nemesis Divina. And what I'm showing you here is the unpublished title page of the first edition of the Archive, which was unpublished because it was stalled for two years because of the uh, Franco-Prussian War. And Katrafage, who was Milne Edwards' other student, the founder of anthropology, using the tools, as he said, of zoology, then draws on this text as an evidence that uh, this too could be one of the examples Linnaeus showed uh, to say that the Germans will be punished for their transgressions. He says here the bilan, the balance sheet, the balance, the nemesis, the allocation, the talio will be registered. And what he puts on his book on the Russian uh, race is this analysis of where all the bombshells uh, landed on the Jardin de Plans uh, during the Franco-Prussian War as uh, little red flecks of shame, evidence of this uh, misdiscretion, the fleur de mal, these endless registers of suffering, of damage that were done during the bombardment. Here's a list of plants that were destroyed in the Serre, what have you. And finally, coming back to my origin point, um, uh, this notion, the, the comparison that uh, the cause uh, detail to me draws is moral, economical, and uh, ultimately architectural. He says um, he says one pays, one had to pay to work at um, at Naples and have what was called the table system. You effectively sung your dinner, you paid for your dinner. Whereas at Ruskoff, this plain, unadorned laboratory, it was sans retribution, no pay. But retribution is also a form of uh, taliation. It's a settling up. It's a making of uh, balances, moral and otherwise. So here's the trajectory we've, we've, we've followed. And I'll end with this, um, obviously too late, but um, this question, the path, the, the theoretical precept that um, Lukas Dutor ultimately um, advocated, which was uh, this notion of, uh, he took from Chev Chevreul or Chevreul? Chevreul. Um, of an a posteriori method of experimentation. You don't proceed from assumptions, but you rather take this expectant attitude and have them confirmed in the ready-made experiments provided by uh, nature. Here's the uh, Chevrolius Calensis, the uh, enormously anomalous um, uh, Ascidian that Lacaz Dutier named for his master at the, uh, the um, Jardin des Plantes. And uh, finally, his, uh, his, his parting statement here from his uh, obsec in uh, 1901, you see the tomb of the and the uh, overlook of uh, Van Yul, uh, and this uh, notion that descriptive uh, zoology, uh, the work of, of, of naming, of, uh, of describing, was done. We are now in an age of experimentation, and the following, as always, the evolution or the change in these organisms. Uh, through experiment. Uh, so I'll leave it there. I'm sure I'm over time. You're oh, good. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. Yep. Um, I just want a little sympathy with this job, right? This, and, and especially we have no time. Um, can I just sit up here for a second so I can look at? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm going to be really, really brief because I, I think we have maybe 20 minutes only. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, there, the, there's a lot that could be said. I'm going to jump straight to the point and try to make a claim. Um, an architectural claim and a historiographical claim. Both, both papers obviously have to do, or the context of both papers is, is how we get architectural knowledge and what is the evidence of that knowledge. Uh, I, I want to suggest that the, the architecture stayed 
too uh, latent in ed's, and 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 therefore I'm going to the the better examples I have come a little more from Zanus because of those just extraordinary photographs and and drawings of the of the herbarium, but also the cabinets. Um, and what I want to suggest is that the apparent political or ideological conclusion that I think we would come of this, which is sort of two examples of 19th century positivism. And I, and I, I'm, I don't mean to say that homogeneous empiricism is, is the same, but one of the questions is, is it, is it too much the same as positivism, which, which would be what most historians would expect to get from this material, that in fact, that's not the conclusion we should come to at all, and, and that we, evidence was presented that contradicts that conclusion. Okay, so that's what I want to go. Um, it, it started when, when Dana mentioned the uh, present analog of her material being in big data. And the way we've taught to un been taught to understand big data research now is through a kind of empiricist or positivist lens. And in particular, that big data in a way, reads itself, interprets itself. That if you have enough data, the data is the answer, unmediated, uninterpreted. And so big data, the, the shift in historiography and the reliance on big data has come with a, a, a concomitant anti-theoretical, uh, anti-mediation uh, stance. And so that would be right to say that big data is the 21st century analog of 19th century positivism. But look at the forms that we, the architectural forms that we encountered, even in these short presentations. The, uh, in in Zainab's, the circle of that one uh, drawing that you showed, the file cabinet itself, that territorial section, these are extraordinary architectural forms to which Ed added these drawings and diagrams, but also the brief uh, photographs of the laboratories we got where the kind of tool accommodation or the, the, the tools that accommodate this research, and even finally the level of architectural expression in that unadorned architecture, th these are also forms that, that carry certain architectural forms that carry certain claims that, that I'm going to try to argue go against a positive readings. And it has, my re reason for going against it has to do with naming. Um, Zainab insisted that the ultimate goal of these, this taxonomy and the architecture of that taxonomy was to name each sheet. Naming is very powerful in psychoanalytic theory in, in psychoanalytic, and in, in, well, in, in, in theory generally. Um, I, I want to come to that. I want to suggest, Ed, that, that uh, voir venir um, is, it, it, to see things is, is, an, is also a, a process of nomination. But also, it, it's voir venir les choses. Uh, uh, it's seeing things to come. It's thing, seeing the things coming. And I would even bend the French a little and say, seeing them coming as things. Uh, and, and with that, this, it, it, in effect, it is to name things. And, that's, and your 3D graphics, which I didn't quite understand, seems to be more of that uh, attempt to nominate and see things coming as things, to name things. The very fossil state that both, which is analogous, the specimen is a kind of fossil in a way, because it's been decontextualized. It's been, um, it, it, what, what the specimen in Zainab and the fossil in Ed both do is, is, is retain something of an actual event that the, the event itself is, is lost. That too is a, is a naming. It's, it's, a, it's a recollection. Uh, it's, a, it's an act of nomination of something that has been lost. This is Lacan. By naming, chatter is knotted to something of the real itself. And what, so the final thing I want to suggest is that what this effort to list, to categorize, to file, to see things coming 
are all efforts not toward positive knowledge in an unmediated, untheorized way, but is actually look, trying to find an index of the real itself, something that's below, if you will, ontologically below science, underneath science, something that's so fundamental that the closest representations we could possibly have of it, the real, the, the, thing, the things themselves, the thing itself, the closest representation would be fossils, traces, indices of that real, and those are, that's the thing, the, th the things um, that we should see coming. No, I just wanted to look at them while I was talking. I, I was always thinking of you as part of the chorus. Yeah, know? yeah, no, I'm the chorus. I just, yeah. No, that was the, come on up. That was the first responder. I, thank you. Because yeah. uh, that is. So I'm sure you have questions for each other. What? Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, okay. Maybe we need them for the video. You're right. Um, I thought that was, yeah. I also had a, a question about naming, too. And I was just wondering, Michael, when you said that, whether the naming um, uh, does what you say, but it's also then maybe allied with what the um, the way in which architecture satisfies naming in some way. I'm not sure whether then that's are we back to a kind of yes. evidence-based naming, or if it doesn't have that sort of architectural completion, then it's um, then it somehow it. It's ephemeral, and it needs, or it, it doesn't have to be architectural completion. It could land anywhere, but it it land it uh, architectural. The cabinet, for example, is another certification, in a certain sense of its power as evidence. It would be another way to put it. Um, but I just, yeah. So I wanted to um, also, yeah. So we could follow up on that, and you can respond to that or something else. But I just wanted to throw in the autopoetic system as a kind of curious contemporary, and I don't even know the status of it in biology at this moment, except the late 20th century. What it said was the metabolic closure of the system. The uh, systems are organizationally closed and energetically open. So the therefore the question of is I wanted to know just whether there was a way in which we could talk about the openness of a system, which is the restless metabolic system, potentially would be an openness not just to you know cybernetic uh, idea, thermodynamic energy, when you know oxygen and so forth, but it would also be the desire to organize energy externally organically, and which would mean that it would um, try to compete in a certain sense with the internal organization of the metabolic system. And that, and that would, might then, to a certain degree, be represented as politics, or it could be political in character, or it could be uh, in some, or it could be, it could take on moral or moral in character in, in, in for, trying to inform the sort of uh, its externality to the, you know, the deep interiority of the metabolic system or whatever. Try to control it. And that what we, what we think of when we say that is the subject, of course, the usually. But this is a much more intimate relationship in a funny way. And I suppose biopolitics came into it at a certain moment and there's other ways in which it uh, developed. But I'm just, I'm, I mean, I'm interested in living in the dead too, the live, the lot, the looking at the life cycle as a way of um, s uh, the manner of knowing, and the looking at the dead plant as the manner of knowing, you know, or something. The the dead plant glued onto a paper sheet. So that's at, at versus the, you know, one is uh, more, um, yeah. Are, the, are they the same? Are they the same kind of taxonomic forces or taxonomic exercises? Okay. Yeah. 
eight different questions there. Um, I want to I want to come back to your final question in just one second because I think it gets most directly to the connection here. Very quickly, Michael, the issue of naming and fossils. I, I think of Link's uh, work on Asterians or starfish, where his is gorgeous uh, Francis piece where he shows caves, the workers excavating fossilized starfish from caves. Other side, um, he shows fishermen with nets uh, drawing starfish out of the sea. And he has this beautiful bit talking about stars falling from the sky, such that what's in the sky shall be on earth, so the living shall be native with the dead. And the common vocabulary of the fossil record, the living record. Um, so these metaphors go on consistently. Naming, because we don't have time, it, it's a gargantuan topic. And what I think with very Philip and I probably topic, share yeah. is a very nerdy interest in the nomenclatural conventions that were at work. Including the Q rule, which was an enormously powerful rule of disavowing the power of local observers to, in fact, attach names to plants, because it rewrote the rules of priority, which is Also, as Zainab said, the riot of synonymy, the problem of the, the, the riot of names that you had to get through before, as Zainab says, it's a process of triangulation. In natural history, and I'm going to call botany provisionally a branch of natural history, is a um, on the table. On that. Michael, I'm not sure if I understand your question or comment uh, correctly, but I actually don't think, I, I completely agree with you. And I quite like this idea of understanding not only the naming of a species, but also putting it in a cabinet as a kind of almost Althusserian KU kind of act. I think that's very powerful. And it is the other side of this kind of empiricism or positive whatever you'd like to uh, call it. I think that's a very, I, I'd like to, with your permission, incorporate it into my chapter now. But um, I just want to point out that the index here is a different kind of index in that, you know, some of these uh, herbarium sheets are so old that um, they, don't, they don't even have the original species or the specimen. It's disobedient. Sometimes you see the outlines of it. So the index, to a certain extent, doesn't even matter. What matters mm -hmm. is the data that accompanies it. In a way, there was a revival of the index in the 20th century because for the first time, you know, these botanists could actually take little, tiny little samples and uh, subject the, you know, the specimen to genetic analysis. But before that, it wasn't, I would argue, it wasn't the index in the sense that we understand indexes. In a way, it couldn't have, it, 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 it's a placeholder of sorts, mm -hmm. not a conventional But isn't index. its importance sort of the fact it's being stored and archived? Yes, absolutely. In I mean, that it's sense. Not the, that, isn't that the yeah, crucial? It's not the, it's, it's, it's not the molecules have disappeared. It's, right. it's the fact that it's Precisely. I like that stored. argument very much. Yeah. That yeah. is the ultimate, yeah. it's the ultimate naming is the, you know, the Placing in the in the in the cabinet and in the herbarium and in you know Q yeah. as opposed to I mean I think that actually strengthens the yeah. naming. Well, and also that's where the architecture. That's right. Right. that's right. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. So I like yeah. that very much. Yeah. Thank you. And it, it would be the case as well with herbarium sheets that as, as also in collections of specimens that that's and um, Zainab alluded to this the sheet was prepared by particular botanists. It is the evidence of someone's autopsy. I have seen. Nobis is the word you would have in a uh, 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 botanical talk. I have seen. Nobis. And people like uh, Kandol, even in his descriptions of plants, he would put an um, uh, exclamation point, which was a sign of certitude, which meant that I have seen the very, very sheet to which this author is referring, and or he would put a um, a uh, sign of dubiety or a question mark saying that it's represented in a book, but I have, don't have the ultimate reference. I haven't indexed it to what Lamarck, say, described as this species of plant. So mm. it is a signature in the old fashioned right. sense. Mm -hmm. But it's also an index in the sense. That's right. like, yeah, that's but the question of scene, just a, which we can pick up also on your, on, on the scene of the life cycle or something, the, 
I, I was struck by the second part of the sentence, or the second part of that phrase, which seemed to be originally quite open as to the manner in which one would proceed to understand that or explain it, and the closure of it when that becomes the method. In other words, it's, it says to see and to, you know, to see or watch the life cycle from step by step all the way through, and uh, to find the manner. Mm -hmm. in, is that right, or is it immediately assume to be the same manner every, you know, is that the description of the manner to, uh, because the manner of investigation, it seemed to me, would be different than the manner in which the plant grew, so to speak, or the, or the, or the living organism grew. Is yeah. it, are they synonymous, are they just the same thing? Because later no. when it gets reversed, when, you know, like at the air, it gets attributed to Aristotle, it's reversed. Right. The, the very the, quick response is plants have nowhere near the complexity of the life cycle of these organisms. And that's why when Rene mm -hmm. spoke about prolepsis, it was a question of what he called the cortex and medulla. You know, the, the, the medulla is growing, the cortex constrains it, and right. pop. But, um, but with, your, with something Zainab said, which has had enormous impact on me, she, she can tell you the exact language. She talked about the, the reemergence of the conservative Aristotelian notion of hierarchy, and that struck me that that's what's going on here. Mm -hmm. It's not an open-ended, groovy, let's see right. what happens. He's imposing right. precisely right. that, how the, the, the how domestic economy right. of the laboratory. Right. This from a lifelong bachelor who lived in his laboratory and routinizing yeah. unhappily <laughs> precisely what you're saying. It, yeah. it is a closure. Yeah. 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 And yeah. to me, that's the larger story here, the you know, opening and closing of these systems and the emergence yeah. of what I you know, call a certain kind of um, sensibility that we now know as political economy. I think that's, in a mm -hmm. way, the bigger, and I was very struck by how much it came up in yours as well. Yeah. Are there questions from the audience? Would anybody like to ask a question? Yeah. So thank you for that talk. I just have a question. I don't know much about the biology of this time, but <laughs> from what little I know. Um, so um, I'm just wondering like this idea of the possibility of infinity and how sort of yeah. in the architectural example that you give, um, it's sort of, it seems like it's almost doing the opposite precisely to produce the infinite because taxonomy itself, you know, post-colonial scholars, you know, have gone on to say, you know, taxonomy itself is a way of reduction in order to perpetuate sort of scalability. Because without, you know, like, you have to reduce it in order to perpetuate this idea of infinity. Because without, that's what classification does, right? It reduces the object to a name. So I'm just wondering, like, where is this idea of, like, interbreeding? Because I think if we're talking about growth and infinity of possibilities in this time, like, the scientists of this, this time weren't necessarily like just limited to, to this idea of taxonomy, but were interested in interbreeding the species in order to perpetuate the growth of these species. Whereas the architecture seems to be doing the reverse, right? It's, it's just literally getting the dead plants and then putting them in these sheets, but it's actually kind of going reverse to this idea of interbreeding of yeah. the species, and which is fundamental. Like fecundity or whatever of the... Or, yeah, I, I had that same question sort of about infinity. Yeah, could you clarify? I mean, I've never come yeah. across, to be perfectly honest, to interbreeding, uh, which also seems like a, a, a you know, post-colonial, <laughs> one of those terms that uh, have been uh, used recently a great deal. Infinity, I believe, and I still, I know I need to formulate that better in this chapter, but for me, it's, is it's the moment that this, um, I mean, there, there's a tension there, right? On the one hand, as you say, there's an imposition of this um, a reduction of the you know, multitude of the world into a simpler taxonomic system. And on the other hand, it seems to me over and over again that the point of that reduction is to precisely realize this kind of strange, magical, and that's, those are the only words that I can come up with, and I relied on the work of early modern, early modern historians who have, you know, trace these ties that something happens and um, 
things are um, unbelievably uh, multiply and expanded beyond any rational explanation. I mean, actually, you see the same kind of logic when you look at someone like Buckminster Fuller, who, you know, uh, there's almost an element of magic there that yep. suddenly it takes off. And to me, we are still operating with that strange, um, even like, uh, yes, I mean, yeah, even right. in the Silicon Valley uh, discourse, yeah. there's this, you know, yeah. uh, magic. Uh, I mean, they don't say alchemy, but it's a promise of infinity. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. And yeah. But, it's but, but it's exactly that dimension which I meant by signaling the Lacanian wheel. It's it's the part of the facts that can't be named, but that still resonate underneath right. all the effort to name. Yeah. Right. So but I mean, I would say that hits them in the head because yeah. it doesn't work. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just go back to the inter interbreeding thing? Um, I think it's just because I've come across this like text which talks about sugarcane not being a species, it's actually a clone. So um, Linnaeus' yeah. system was sort of debunked because yeah. sugarcane yeah. was actually, it's a clone, not a species that you cannot yeah. interbreed. So Linnaeus, so I'm just thinking in terms of like, where does where does the limitations of the system come in? That's all I'm saying, you know, I'm not trying to be. Yeah, and yeah. how does architecture? Well, part of that, I don't know if it's Linnaeus, I mean, my technical response out of time, but you know, Linnaeus set out his system. You have to remember that, the, the, and this goes back to Michael's comment, which I think is so provocative, that if you're a plant system, you have a very clear idea of what taxon you consider natural and which you think are purely systematic, whether it's the species level, level the genus level, or family order, what have you. Mm. Um, Linnaeus, in the Philosophical Botanic of it, the next, uh, Dan was talking about quite, uh, he, he prohibited varieties, that, and they weren't allowed, because the, the varieties were the work of, um, Synonymy. yeah, it, it was the work of, of plant breeders. He wasn't interested in that, and it didn't get to uh -huh. um, a proper work of identifying, um, according to the sexual system, the plant. So when Catherine has what you do with dead plants to living organisms, you do very different things. You have very different sciences, but I, I hear your point, but I'm saying, yeah. I, I didn't want to allow in the room that further claim that whoever you're reading made that <laughs> Linnaeus was debunked because yeah. uh, I, the paper technology is interesting, maybe uh, very interesting here too. The paper technologies that allowed it to be shuffled, or shuffled and re yeah. repositioned, and and a kind of early calculability of you know or com computational kind of moves. Yeah. Well, and with uh, the metadata could be. Put with the specimen. Yeah, with the specimen, yeah. and that you could actually add new and sort of yeah, yeah. reconfigure, and that it actually expanded into all these buildings was uh, gener had generative properties, just as the paper was yeah. the problem, you know, in a way. Is. But I also was thinking that the paper technology flatten of flattening the plant seemed to me very strange and interesting that you would squash it and then you would glue it. You know, and uh, or put some kind of seal on it so it wouldn't just it seemed to me to be a kind of extended paper mm -hmm. extension of the paper te techno technological, which also was governing the whole expansive principle of it. So it seemed that seemed uh, mm -hmm. so, and the flattening of it then sort of renders it as a different kind of entity. Uh, mm -hmm. and, a, a, an entity not necessarily entitled to a name, you could mm -hmm. say almost, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> not a name in the sense that we name things organic for their organic reproductive powers mm -hmm. and everything. That's now, you know, now, yeah. It's not just dead, it's flat. <laughs> anyway, so I don't know, but last word. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Last yeah, word. Thank last you. word. I mean, Catherine, oh. Catherine, this is the fifth now of these discussions that Catherine curated. It's actually the sixth. Sixth. Yeah. Sixth. Um, this is the sixth discussion that Catherine has curated, and they've been, one is almost more remarkable than the next because of the, they always, they often have players who, one player who is 
in at the GSD, and then you bring other people to be interlocutors with our faculty. But, but I really appreciate that, and I think they've gotten better and better, and they've they've hit many different uh, topics, but always w with a kind of urgency that it just feels very contemporary and very almost urgent that we talk about these things, and this brings some of the the best minds in the field. So thank Catherine for oh, for bringing you. this. Yeah, thank and you. And thank you for filling this role that I gave yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> I know you've often wanted to just dump it and come up here and feed that person who was it was <laughs> like this first responder stuff. <laughs> anyway, thank you.